Welcome to the second session in the PHP track. And uh, our speaker in this session is Rob Allen. You might be familiar with this name. Um, Rob is a software consultant and developer, and he's a big, big part of the Slim and Zen community. Um, he runs 19 Feet Limited, a UK-based, um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you call it, IT consultancy? Yeah, we're development and consultancy business. So hire me. <laughs> all right, and he's gonna. All right, he's gonna talk about um, protecting your or our APIs with OAuth two. So give it up for Alan. Thank you. Now this is a multi-track conference, so you could have chosen any other track, and you have picked this one. Thank you. My wife was convinced there'd be no one here, so I got to take a photo to prove to her. <laughs> that I had some attendees. Thank you. Right, so I write APIs, that's what I do for a living. More often than not, my day job is extracting data from remarkably horrible legacy systems and creating an API so that we can have more modern systems talking to this legacy data. I also do quite a lot of integration with other people's APIs. So I'm fairly opinionated about APIs, and I'm particularly opinionated about authentication of APIs. Because getting it wrong is horrible. Getting it wrong makes it very difficult for people to integrate against your APIs. And getting it wrong can make your APIs insecure. So we're going to talk about authentication today. And as you can tell from this slide, we're going to talk about OAuth 2, which is a standard for doing authentication of APIs. And I think this is a very good standard and I think you should adopt it if you are not already adopting it. Is anyone here using OAuth 2 today? OK, a few people. You might not learn very much, but you might do, we'll see. The rest of you hopefully will learn lots, and you'll think, yes, that's why I want to use my next API project. So let's start a little bit about what API is and what authentication is. You need to know who is logging into your API. Public APIs are wonderful for everyone else, <laughs> as long as you're not having to pay for it. If you are responsible for paying for your web service, then authentication is very, very helpful. You can rate limit rogue applications. You know who's logging in, so you can revoke application access if it turns out that you need to because the application is doing nefarious things with data. And you can allow users to control this information with um, OAuth 2 so that the user can control which third-party applications have access to their data on your API. So we've got multiple things in play here. Authorization is really, really easy as a basic system. It is simply an HTTP header. Now, I say simply, and I say HTTP header. The HTTP protocol contains numerous parts, and one of the sections is the header section, where we could provide out-of-band information along with our actual data. And one of the headers, authorization header, enables us to control and pass through authenticated information. So you see an example here. This is a GET request. So I'm requesting a list of books from a remarkable API called api.example.com. I pass an accept header because I need to tell the server what sort of data I want back. And I pass in an authorization header, which enables me to tell the server who I am, what my credentials are. The authorization header has a token name followed by the actual token itself. This one is a basic authorization header, which means that the token or the information is in plain text. It doesn't look like plain text because it's Base64 encoded, but that is a plain text authentication system. Hence, you can Base64 decode it, and you discover that my password is open sesame. Don't use this authentication system. It's not a very good one. It was great 30 years ago. Not so great now. Biggest problem is that you're passing a username and password through to the API, which means that the client has to know the user's password. Now, that could be acceptable in some scenarios. So you imagine the Twitter 
a system. So Twitter has an API. We have an official Twitter client. Your data is with Twitter. Your relationship is with Twitter. So with the official Twitter client, you might be OK typing in your username and password. What about if you're using a third party application? Let's say you're using Tweetbot, a popular application for iPhones. Do you want the people who write Tweetbot to know your Twitter password? Should they know it? What about for your uh, Google information? Do you want random applications knowing your password? Probably not. It's not an ideal scenario. This is one of the fundamental problems with basic auth. The credentials are known to the clients. And secondarily, they are passed through in every single request. So there's quite a large attack surface there. Which brings us to OAuth 2. OAuth 2 solves these problems. Um, it has a logo because it's modern. This is a new thing nowadays. It must have a logo. If you don't have a logo, you're nowhere. Unfortunately, they're not too good with copy. So the OAuth 2 authorization framework enables a third-party application to obtain internet access from an HTTP service. It's not particularly exciting stuff, this. But it is completely accurate. That is what we are doing. And it was designed by committee. When things are designed by committee, that's got some positives, and it has some less good connotations. So the positives, some really bright people thought about this process and came up with this standard. People brighter than you, people brighter than me, people who care much more than we do. So this is a very big positive for this framework. The downside is that it was designed by a committee and since the specification is not that easy to read. It's a little bit verbose, there's a lot of it. It's quite tedious to read, which is why we're talking about it in hopefully easy way to uh, understand. The standard defines a number of different roles. So the type of uh, products, people, services that are involved in getting authorization to occur. So firstly, we have the user. Because it was designed by committee, we call that the resource owner. It's just a user. We have the third party application. We have the client, so the application that is going to talk to our API. We have the API itself, the resource server. And finally, we have the authorization server, which is the bit that actually does the authentication itself. So the standard splits up doing the authentication from the serving of the API itself. In practice, most of us put those two together. So the, the application that does your authorization is the same application that is sending your API data out as well. But from the standards point of view, there are two separate logical roles. The standard also defines different ways for how we do the authorization itself, because there are multiple different scenarios involved, and we call these grant types. The one that OAuth is well known for is called the authorization code grant type, and that's used with third party um, applications like the Tweetbot with Twitter example, because we are, have third party applications, we have a user, and we have the organization that runs the API. We also have a far simpler grant type called the password grant type, which is, should only be used for first party applications the Twitter application talking directly to the Twitter API, you enter your password on the Twitter app. That is very much a password grant type, works very well for first party apps. Client credentials is for when you have a cron job that needs to talk to the API. You don't have a user involved at all, but you have an application that needs to talk to the API to do batch processing, for instance. We have a method for authorizing that particular type of client. And finally, we have the implicit grant type for third-party JavaScript applications, because JavaScript applications run in the browser and hence are very, very difficult to secure because you can't have any passwords or security credentials in an app that you can view source on. We already looked at the authorization header. For a OAuth 2 authorization header, we use the word bearer as our name. So we use basic for basic auth, we use the word bearer for 
our authorization header for OAuth2, and then there is some string. That string can be anything, doesn't really matter. So let's look at the easy scenario first, the password grant scenario. Works through to our first party apps. You're writing the app, you're writing the API. This is the method that you can use. It is remarkably easy because it's not very complicated because we allow the user to type their password in. Twitter app. Enter your username and password, you get access to the Twitter API. How do we actually go about doing this? What's the flow look like? We have a user. The user logs in with username and password into the application. The application will ask the authorization server for a token. It says, give me a token, here is the username and password. The authorization server will say, here's a token. Assuming you got the username and password right. And now the application can talk to the API passing that token to say which user is logged in. That's the entire flow. And this is where you can see that we have separated up the API, which is in this lovely blue color, from the authorization server in the greens. They can be the same application. They are just different endpoints on the same application. You don't actually have to split them if you don't want to. It's not a particularly complicated flow, so how would you actually implement this in PHP? We live in the modern world today. Has everyone heard of Composer? Okay. That's a relief. Don't write this yourself. We're past that in the PHP world. We have Composer for doing all the code that we can't be bothered to write. That's what Composer is for. And then OAuth 2 implementation at the server level, sorry, server level is a classic example of letting someone else who is more interested than me write this code. So and that someone is Brent Schaffer. He works for Adobe, very bright lad. He's written a really, really good OAuth 2 server. So that's what we're going to use. It is not the only one out there. There is another one from the PHP League called probably OAuth server, because nobody's very good at naming things. And that's equally good. And there's a couple of others out there. Pick one. I don't particularly care which one you pick. For this example, we're using Ren Schaffer's version. It implements all the endpoints for you, and it does all the storage for you. You just have to tell it what type of storage you want to keep your information in. Let's see, database, Redis, Mongo, etc. So all you need to do, this makes it sound so simple, all you need to do is set up your database tables, register the OAuth2 server, instantiate it up, and then implement the endpoint and point it at the Brent's code. So you've got to create a number of database tables for storing the relevant information. So, you know, the OAuth clients, access tokens, authorization codes, refresh, code, all, all the stuff you need. Fortunately, in the documentation, there's a block of SQL that you just run, put it in your migration, and that's done. It's relatively quite simple. You can also point this code at your own user's table if you already have one. So you can just do that. You need to instantiate your OAuth2 server. That, again, is quite easy. It's in the namespace OAuth2. Rather imaginatively, the class is called server. So you just implement an OAuth2 server, sorry, instantiate an OAuth2 server, and you need to pass in what type of storage that you want it to store the data or retrieve the data from, use credentials and whatnot. I like PDO, so this is all quite easy. I said there are multiple grant types. You need to tell your server which grant types you're prepared to accept for authorization purposes. So what you do is simply add the grant type by instantiating it on line 11 and then calling add grant type. And now this particular OAuth2 server knows how to handle passwords, usernames and passwords. So we write essentially this block of code. I'm using Slim as an example here. So this is Pimple as a DI container. Create a simple factory that creates my PDO factory, sorry, creates my PDO storage, instantiates my server, adds my user credentials grant type, 
and now I have a fully instantiated Auth2 server for doing all the work. Minor aside, make sure you're using bcrypt. It defaults to MD5. Don't use MD5. That was good in 2003. It's not good in 2017. So turn on bcrypt. It's quite easy to do because it was designed to be simple. And now we can add some data. So we insert a client. Every single application that talks to your API must be known. Don't allow random applications to talk to your API because you can't control them. So you store a list of all the applications. And you have a list of users. You're already used to that. We all know how to log in, so usernames and passwords need those as well. And then we can implement a slash token endpoint where we simply call through to the auth 2 server and the method is called handle token request. So we don't have to implement any of the actual work, we just call straight through to Brent's code. And we're done. I'm a curl person. Uh, there's Postman if you prefer GUIs or poor or whatever, but curl is awesome. If you're working with APIs, learn curl. Highly recommend it. So I do a post request to the token endpoint. I pass through the um, my client ID, my client secret, which is the ID and sorry, the credentials for my particular application. Then I pass through the username and password from the user, Rob123456. I'm not particularly secure with my passwords here. And I get a response back which contains my access token. And you see it's also got an expiry date. Tokens are not very long lived. Have, now I have that token, I can use it against all the actual endpoints of my API. So I need to protect those endpoints. I need to check the token for every single request that comes in to my API. Turns out that's quite easy. We call verify resource request. Pass in a request, it will be turn a true or false for you. Is this token valid, yes or no? If it's not valid, send back an error, 403. If it is valid, go and do some work. If you want to know what information is about that token, there's a get access token data method where you can retrieve data about that token, which can be quite helpful. So if you get it wrong, like here I'm making an API call and I haven't included the um, bearer token, you'll see I get a 401. If I do include the bearer token, then I get 200 OK and I get all the data. So I've now protected this endpoint. I must be logged in. I must have a valid token so that I know as the API server which client is accessing my data and which user it is. That's the basic process. Right, the authorization code is for third party apps. This is Twitterific, needs to get authentication. So it, it requests authentication. You click sign in with Twitter and you end up on Twitter's website for doing your username and password. So Twitterific has no clue what your username and password is because the Twitter website is where you type it in. How does that process work? Slightly more complicated. The user tells the application, I would like to sign in. The application says, well, go and get me a token then. I need a token, go and get me one. What that actually means is it redirects you to the Twitter website. So therefore the user logs in to the Twitter website, the authorization server. The authorization server will say, do you allow this third party application to have access to your data? And you have to reply, yes. When you say yes, the authorization server will send the authorization code to the application. This is normally a GET request. So it is a string known as the authorization code because it gets stored in logs. It is very, very temporal. It doesn't last very long. And the authorization server, sorry, the application uses that authorization code to turn it into a token 
over HTTPS via post requests so that we don't leak the data into logs. And you get back your token. And then we're back to what we were with the password system. We're sending messages with tokens to our API. So it's a little bit more complicated. There's a little bit more processes in place. The application sends you to Twitter's website or to your API's website. User enters your own password, says yes. They have to explicitly say, we allow this application to have access. Then the website will give the application a token and the application will turn that token into, sorry, we'll give an app, get, sorry, the application will get an auth code and then the, app, the API's application will turn that into a token. How do we do that in PHP? Turns out that all we have, all we have to do is write a website. We all know how to write websites, I take it. Pretty good at that by now. We need the website so that we can enter username and password, and then we need an endpoint where we can turn an authorization code into a token. And then the process will just work. Third party app sends the user to our website. We've already written the website, which allows users to log in. Our website gives them the code, and then we have an endpoint where we can send turn that code into a, a token. This code will start looking a bit similar now because it's a very simple add-on to what we've already learned. It's a different credential. So here's what we did previously. We had the user credentials for password grant. We add the authorization code grant type. So now this particular API can accept a username and password or it can handle the third party dance. We need to write a website. Don't get me to write websites for you. I'm not very good at websites. Bootstrap has been wonderful for actually creating something that I can put on slides. Otherwise, this would be Times New Roman. So here's a website. Um, Raj imaginatively, it gives a list of books. And we need a page where you can authorize this third party application. And we can answer yes. And do you remember this bit? I said the user asks the user, logs into the authorization server. The authorization server says, uh, do you authorize this app? And the user answers yes. They press that button. Practically, it looks a little bit more like this. You tend to have your third party website, sorry, your first party website, and you have your first party API, and you want the API to control all the token work. So you make your website talk to your API for doing the actual work. Because that way you don't have to split the code across two separate code bases. And nobody likes splitting code across two different code bases because then it's a maintenance problem. So your website will send that yes request from the user back to the API in order to get the authorization code. So pick an HTTP client in PHP, I don't particularly care. I use Guzzle. I think Guzzle is quite a good API client. You need to talk to APIs from PHP. Yeah, use Guzzle. So we simply do a post request to slash authorize. We send through some data. And we have to authorize ourselves. So we have a bearer token, which is a credentials for our website against our API. The API will then handle that authorization and will send back the authorization code. Again, this is all built into Brent Schaffer's code, so we don't have to write any of this code. We simply have to call validate authorize request, and the actual real work gets done by someone else. And then our website will check for a location header. So our API will return back a location header, which contains an authorization code, which we then send onto the application. And the code looks something like that. This is a slight demonstration application, so it displays it on the screen. Normally, you would just redirect straight back to the application so that you know, you're back in Twitterific or whatever third party app you're in. These slides will be available after the talk, so you can actually sort of delve into it and look at this code in detail. And then we get the token from the code. All we have to do is post to back to our slash token endpoint. We've already used the token endpoint. 
So we're not writing any new code there, and we get back a response. So the converted an authorization code to a token is already handled for us with no additional work on our part. We get the response back. We haven't had to change anything. This is what's nice about using third-party libraries. Last thing I want to talk about is the type of token we're using. Up to now, I've just had this random string, which literally is just a random number. You just have a random string, represents your token. You have to go back to the database to read what that token means to work out which particular user is involved. There's other technologies out there, and this is one of them, which is JWT, which is pronounced JOT. I have no clue why. You remember that whole GIF, GIF thing? JWT is pronounced JOT. It was so important to everyone that you did not forget that, that it is in the first paragraph of the specification. <laughs> Key thing about JOT tokens is that they are cryptographically signed blocks of data, which means that potentially they can be quicker, and it also means that they can scale quite well. So if you have a high volume website, this, or API rather, this might be a technology that's worth thinking about. A JOT token, the T in JOT is token already, so JOT token feels a bit tautological. Um, but JOT token consists of a header, a payload, and a signature. So if the signature doesn't match the payload, you know it's been tampered with. That's the basic idea behind them. Note that they are not necessarily encrypted. So be careful what you store in them. Practically, the payload looks like that. It's a standard, so all these weird short codes over here are the correct terms that are provided by the specification. Um, ID, JTI are both the same value for no apparent reason. Um, but then you've got the issuer ID, which is your API's name. You've got the client ID, so you know which client's involved. You've got the user ID, so you know which user is involved. So we've got the same information as we had for the OAuth requirements but they're now involved directly in the payload of the token, so you don't need to get them from the database. In terms of implementation, if you want to do this, you simply add a new line. Use JOT access tokens. True, and it all magically works. I love this system. I love the party libraries that I don't have to write any code for. So one configuration value, and you can now support JOT tokens and it works exactly as you would think. The biggest difference now is the, the access token is a really long string, which is base64 encoded. It goes on and on and on, which is why we've got those dot, dot, dots there. Let's pretend there's just a lot more code there. Really interesting thing about Jot is that because the information is in the token itself, you don't need to hit the database. So you can actually just cryptographically check the signature in memory, which is why it's faster and it scales better. You don't have to hit the database. So from the code point of view, you have to add a in-memory storage. Otherwise, it'll hit the database because that's the only storage you've told it about. So you add a memory storage for JOT tokens so that they can be cryptographically um, checked in memory rather than going back to the database. Validation code doesn't change. This is exactly the same code as before because a token is a token is a token. They all look the same. Last thing I want to talk about in terms of OAuth 2 is if you remember when we issued that token, it is a very short lifetime. Generally, it's about an hour. Some systems, it's even shorter than that. The token only lasts for 20 minutes. What do you do when that token expires? You refresh it. Because the thing you don't want to do is ask the user to type their username and password in again. Because that would be a quick way to lose users. Can you imagine using Facebook and every 30 minutes you have to retype your username and password in? I think we would lose Facebook, and that may or may not be a good thing. So refresh tokens are the way we turn a token that's expired and get a new one. 
So token expires, we get a new one automatically from our app. And all that happens here is that once the access token is expired, the, a the application can ask the API to give it a new one via the refresh token, which means that a refresh token is like a password. And your applications must treat them like that and keep them safe. Of course, that's not your job as the API owner. That's the job of the application developer. You simply post to the token endpoint again, but this time the grant type is refresh token. You pass in your refresh token and you get back a new access token and your application can carry on allowing your user to post to Facebook, assuming they want to. And that's it. That's a quite a dense talk. We've gone through quite a lot of things related to OAuth 2 and to the grant types that are involved. There are many more grant types than the ones I've spoken about, but the password grant type and the um, authorization code for third-party apps are the two key grant types that you should implement if you're writing an API where you're allowing multiple applications to talk to data that you're holding on behalf of users. There are two actors, you've got the client, you've got the user, the two are logically separate, so you need to think about the needs of both. Your application integrators are not the same people as your users who you maybe have a different relationship with. And your API authentication system needs to reflect that. OAuth 2 is not a difficult standard. It is extremely well thought about. A lot of effort went into designing it and making sure it covered all the use cases that you can think of. And I highly recommend that you implement it over inventing your own. Don't invent your own authentication system. This is a solved problem. OAuth 2 is a solved problem. So these slides will be online later. I'll tweet it out. But there are some useful links. If you want to see a working example, uh, on GitHub, my Slim Bookshelf API is a JavaScript app that talks to, sorry, is a website and an API that talk together to enable authorization around OAuth 2 third parties. OAuth2.net slash 2 is the standard. So I've put that on there because I feel like I should point you to the official reference, but it's really hard to read. So the second one down and the third one down are the ones you should be looking at. Uh, B. Schaffer's GitHub library is very well documented and easy to read their documentation. And Aaron uh, Parecki's website, OAuth2 Simplified, is a fantastic resource for understanding OAuth2. That's me done. Perfect. Thank you. Great talk. So now we would go on for the Q&A. And if you've been here in the last talk, um, this time you're going to actually give around the mic. Reason being is that the audio of the microphone goes directly into the camera. So it makes more sense to have that, like, if people are watching the video later on, uh, to, have, to have the sound um, from the microphone in there. OK, that being said, any questions? OK, cool. In the middle. So what I want is someone over there to ask a question next, and then someone down here. Um, hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is, uh, what happens the next time that, that I use Twitterific? Uh, does it keep the refresh token and use it to get a new access token? Exactly. It uses the refresh token. So I said the refresh token is to be kept like a password. So a refresh token is a password that represents this user for this app and it has a lifetime as long as your API is happy to trust it. Normally, that's measured in days, weeks, months, a long, long while. So yes, yeah, so next time you start Twitter Twitterific up, it's got a refresh token. It can turn that refresh token into an access token, and then it can talk to your API again. Or to Twitter's API, I hope. Thank you. <laughs> uh, 
uh, in the example where mm -hmm. you showed uh, when you don't give a token in the request, in the answer, there was a PHP version. Do you recommend on an authorization server to show the PHP version? That was right back here, wasn't it? Where was it? Ooh, all the way back. Somewhere there. Too far? No, I can't remember. <laughs> um, no, you shouldn't. Okay. What, one, of the things of, one of the things about demo code is that as a speaker that's creating these codes, I'm quite lazy. And you'll also notice that I use the PHP web server. So I use the built-in development server quite a lot for my day-to-day -day work. So PHP minus capital S gets you a development server runs locally. It's very, very convenient for development work and is completely and utterly inappropriate for production servers, almost by definition. Security is a really interesting topic, and how much level of risk you're prepared to take is important. Exposing which PHP version you're running, and which Apache version or Nginx version you're running, is opening up a bit of a wide attack surface that you don't need to do. So I wouldn't expose my PHP version on a normal production website because why tell potential attackers oh we're on you know, PHP 7.1.3 and we know 7.1.6 has had a bug fix for some security issue you've automatically told everyone there's a potential bug here that they might be able to uh, exploit so I would definitely turn it off um, but as you can tell when I write slides for talks I can't be bothered it's not important enough for me to remember I have a second question. Mm -hmm. When you uh, made the curl request in yeah. the data part, you have a dollar sign. What does it mean? Now that Just one, I, for more information. That one I definitely need to show you. So we are going to have to find it. Yeah, there, there it is. On no, the minus D in four. No, not that one. Which one? Yeah. On, on line four. Ah, yes. It's a curl thing that tells it to treat this next bit as a multi-line blocker code. That's all it does. Um, by doing the dollar, then uh, open the double quotes. It's a bash thing that means that bash is now going to treat the next block of code so that I can lay it out nicely. Otherwise, it'd all have to be on one really long line. And that would be really hard for you to read. Because uh, normally in bash, as you can see on lines one, two, and three, you use a backslash at the end of the line to go to the next line. So to lay out a bash command, we put the backslash in, makes it look pretty easier to read. You can't do that inside the JSON blob. Because obviously that becomes part of the JSON and bad things happen. So curl's got this formatting system where you can, or bash rather, there's dollar followed by a single quote. You can then put a multi-line string in and bash will do the right thing. So it comes from that. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, for me, a question regarding JOT. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, you said uh, the contents of the JOT token are cryptographically signed, yep. which means for me uh, that uh, also the OAuth server and the, the resource servers need to know a secret. Do you know any software that can manage this kind of stuff in a uh, distributed environment, just for example, a microservice cloud cluster? Yes, but I've gotten its name. <laughs> HashiCorp makes something. I think it's called Vault. It's Vault, yeah. Yeah, something like HashiCorp Vault. Docker's got one. Whose name again? I can't remember. And there's one that everyone uses, Kubernetes. I've also forgotten. Okay. Um, there are products out there to handle that for you. Essentially, you just need the public key. Then, if I showed you that here, there. Essentially, you need the public key at one end and the private key at the other in order for this to work. Um, you need to store those somewhere fairly secure, preferably not in Git and preferably not as part of your um, general access area, which is why something like Vault is really good for this. Pick one, use it, and okay. just make it part of your deployment system. Did you use it? Any experience practically? I have no experience of it because I don't use Jot. Okay. Thank you very much. Hello, uh, thank you for your Hi. interesting talk. 
Uh, I was just wondering what would happen if uh, we just extended the expiry time of the token instead of using refresh token? Not a lot. Um, you lose some of the benefits of having a short lift token. The problem with a long lift token is it can get stolen. It shouldn't get stolen, but man in the middle attacks do happen. So you are l increasing your um, attack surface by making it very long lived. The other thing you're doing is it's that much, particularly with a JOT token, it's really hard to expire it if the user decides that they no longer want this app to have access. If you can't, if you have a really long refresh token, sorry, really long expiry time, because that token is now valid for a lot longer time. So which is why the spec has a short access token or short lived access token and a long lived refresh token. It's all about managing the risk of the loss of that token to the world. Right? In websites, we talk about session fixation for the same reason. Right? When you log a user in, you have to regenerate the session ID for the same reasoning. We want to avoid the fact that someone might have stolen it and now have got additional privileges because you've logged in. It's the same basic idea, but at an API level. Thank you. There was someone down here. I'm disappointed the people at the back are not alternating here. Yeah, that's, that's unfair. So, so we, sh we should do at least one in the back. <laughs> There's one just here. So. Oh, no. So you fill in and... So uh, when do you recommend to refresh the token? For example, the user have the valid token and the server has the refresh token. When is the appropriate time for that? On every request or when there is even less uh, lifetime? Right, the refresh token only goes once. So on first author authorization, you get back a refresh token. To, you give it to your application. The application keeps that safe. We never ever send that again. So if the application loses their refresh token, then they will have to ask the user to re-log in with their username and password. Length of time you keep an access token expiry depends. So the examples here were for about an hour. I so say I've seen some 20 minutes. I've also seen some 12 hours, and some people even do 24 to 48 hours. It's risk management. How long do you like it to be? Personally, I recommend keeping them really short for your development sandboxes. So when a developer is integrated against your API, make all the refresh times really, really short, so they're forced to implement how to do refresh tokens and actually implement the entire process and see it in action whilst they're in development. Because the last thing you want is them to go live and then they realize they've not implemented refresh tokens right or something. So keep things short in development and then extend them in production if you want a slightly longer access token time. But to refresh tokens, you never replace them and you never send them more than once. Yeah, but uh, when do you refresh the access token? When the last one runs out. So the easiest way to do that, so the access token expires after an hour. So as an application, I could keep a note of the time limit and go and get one before the time runs out. Practically no one does that. What you actually do is you send the request to the API and the API comes back saying token is invalid. So at that point, you go and get a new refresh token. What I have seen for mobile apps is that they get a new access token when they are started up because they're guessing that the last one's already run out. It's a reasonable guess. But you can just hit the endpoint. You'll get back a 403 so you know to go and get a new refresh token. OK, thank you. There's one down here. Thanks. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, I don't use this, but I remember from a video training I saw a, year, a few years ago that uh, there was a big controversy in the design of OAuth 2, and one guy left. About there was, wasn't there? Very, very bitter. And can you explain what this was about? And if it's impossible to explain within a few seconds, so you don't do it. <laughs> I don't know the full details, but the fundamental the problem was around the fact that the token is not encrypted. So in OAuth 1, 
all the um, encrypt all the data that was transferred as part of this was HMAC encrypted. And in OAuth 2, it is not. So one of the requirements of OAuth 2 is that you must have SSL. I forgot to mention that. But don't run this on pure HTTP. Always run it under TLS. And the gentleman that was unhappy about the process was not happy with that requirement. Part of that was that uh, OAuth 2 is a few years old now. Let's Encrypt is fairly recent. So SSL certificates were expensive and difficult to do. And that, he felt, was a barrier to entry and was problematic, particularly with JavaScript applications. I think that's not really a problem. I think if you're running anything that looks like a website or an API that isn't under SSL, then you're doing it wrong. So I think it is far less of a problem than I think he feared, personally at least. That's my understanding of that problem. And your other question? Um, what is the relationship of OWASP 2 to, to the World Wide Web Consortium? Is this an endorsed standard, or do they have a competitive standard? Or? It's an RFC. So like all the other standards related to the web, RFCs from the Internet Engineering Task Force are where we document this stuff. OWASP 2 is documented over a number of RFCs that are horrible to read. But it's worth reading them. Because it is interesting. If you're interested in it like I am, it is worth reading. But they are very dense to read. But the whole logo thing is because that's the way you market stuff nowadays. It is just an RFC like everything else. Perfect. So thank you very much for the talk, for the Q&A afterwards. And uh, the next talk is going to be um, building our own domain-specific languages with PHP. So if that's interesting to you, feel free to stay. Thank you very much. Thank you.